We're good. Go ahead. Well, here we are for our fourth in the series of fixing the framers' original, what does it say? Failures. There we go. I'm still Diane Post, and he's still Bob McWhorter. And so uh, we have one more after tonight, right? Yes. And Bob has brought some more books for those of you who missed the opportunity last week. All right. Thank you. On to you, Bob. You know, with the Zoom world, I always feel like we can start by saying, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of America and all the ships at sea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you never okay. heard, but you have to have a. Oh, and I've got that. Okay, let's see. All right, there we go. Uh, as I left off last time, uh, tonight's talk is going to be more centered on what the Supreme Court did. And the subtitle is The Supreme Court versus the Gettysburg Address. Subtitle. Yeah. Justice Jackson is ready to, to really stir things up. She's fun. Kind of nice to see on her first, first time right off the bat. She's ready to go. Um, look, the Wade and Fuller courts uh, were, to my mind, uh, the worst courts in Supreme Court history. Uh, in, in the sense of what they did to just gut the entire purpose of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment and essentially negate the Civil War and the effect of the Civil War, what the Civil War was about. I might have to do this for another day. Um, for this court, there was no new, new birth of freedom. It was not until the Warren Court of the 1960s that the Dunning adherents, remember the Dunning School, talking about you know, all this lost cause stuff, this, this terrible academic gloss um, that kind of gutted this thing. Kind of got challenged. The United States versus Price, 1966, the Supreme Court finally cited historians for the obvious principle that the 14th Amendment protected freedmen's rights. It took that long to do it. Um, I'll, I'll kind of draw your attention to this picture. Uh, every year the Supreme Court sits for a picture. Um, they're always in line. To my knowledge, this is the only court picture that's ever been taken, against, which I think tells you a lot about the Warren Court. I mean, they were just ready to do things differently. I've never seen another Supreme Court picture with that angle. Um, so it was remarkable. Uh, by the way, United States versus Price was the case that resulted from Mississippi burning. That was the case from the murder of Andrew Goldman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner uh, that eventually went up to the Supreme Court and was the subject of the movie that was kind of one of the based on it. It's a pretty good movie. Now, the 14th Amendment again says all persons born naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the state. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state derive any person of life, liberty, or property without a due process of law, nor deny any person the equal protection of laws. You know, I don't see how you can have that much difficulty interpreting the, the words. I, I don't think it's going to be any clearer than that. But, you know, Take a lawyer to tell you what words really that say don't say what they mean. You know that, that's that's what we can do here, right? Well, as I've told you before, this is why the Bill of Rights directly applies to us. It's the vehicle of the Fourteenth Amendment that gets the First Amendment, gets the Second Amendment, gets all these other amendments to directly apply to us, uh, which was a radical change in American structure of government. Now, the Wade and Fuller courts, their failure to accept the Congress and the nation. And charted a new course. Again, I, I cite the section five. The Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. First time, well, the 13th Amendment used this language, 14th and 15th. That's the first time these amendments put this language into the Constitution, radically changing it. And the people passed it as the original Constitution allowed in Article 5. That's how you amend the Constitution, and that's what matters. So again, when we talk about originalism, Congress will have the power. Whose original intent matters here? 1791 or 1870? Well, for the subjects of racial equality and all equality for every person, says every person, the framers of 1791 do not matter. To the extent that they gave us the words and concepts of we the people and, and 
all men are created equal. Great, that's a great start. But this was designed to fix the framers' thing. It's these people get that. Now, the section leaves no doubt that the framers meant to enforce it with full federal power, including the Department of Justice, federal courts, and the military. This reshuffled the deck of government. The national government now has authority to intervene in local affairs to protect the basic rights of Americans. We have national values when it comes to issues of racial justice. We have national values when it comes to issues of LGBTQ rights. National values of matters, not your local school board that wants to ban a book or your local state that wants to maintain segregation. One consistent voice on the court got it right, and that's John Marshall Harlan. He's the one that you want to print out and put on your wall. Okay. Because this is the guy that knew it and then both the way and full of courts. He's the clarion call. He's the one that people go back to when we finally start to get this right in the 1960s. Now, what the way and fuller courts did was they went back to an old opinion from Chief Justice John Marshall Baron versus Baltimore, okay, 1833, well before the Civil War. And what they did is they relied on this. The Bill of Rights demanded security against the apprehended encroachments of the general government, not against those of local governments. In other words, it applies only to the feds, not to the states. And the, these amendments to the Bill of Rights contain no expression indicating an intention to apply them to the state governments. Okay? That is the Constitution in 1833. Now, this is where you get to the part, well, but did we even read the 14th Amendment, which was the way in the courts? They relied on Barron versus Baltimore for the majority of their opinions to just ignore the 14th Amendment. There was reason to expect the courts should have done better. Abraham Lincoln, by the way, was the first great court packer. You know, all this talk about court packing. You want a court packer, it's Abraham Lincoln. Here's what happened uh, Justice Stephen Fields. Um, what Lincoln wanted to do was create an anti slavery majority to overturn Chief, Chief Justice Taney's Dred Scott decision. All right? Taney dies, and he's going to put Stephen Field in. Uh, he appoints uh, four associate justices and one chief justice. And what Lincoln did in 1863 is he got Congress to give him the 10th justice. Now, the most Supreme Court justices there have ever been have been 10, and that's because of Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you remember in the debate with Kamala Harris, she made the point that not before the 1864 Lincoln, election, Lincoln refused to appoint a justice. She made that point. But Lincoln didn't fill a seat this close to an election, which, of course, fell on deaf ears because the Republicans immediately filled the seat. Well, Taney dies 1864. Congress is in recess until after the election. So in reality, Lincoln kind of couldn't make him the seat. And he also wanted to keep Salmon Chase, who was in his cabinet, and always thought Salmon Chase went through his life never totally figuring out how Lincoln beat him <coughs> and not him. Um, and so he wanted to keep Salmon kind of dangling. He was going to give him the chief justice ship, but he wasn't going to do it in 1864. He was going to do it afterward. So Lincoln, yeah, he didn't avoid that close to an election, but I don't think it was quite on a matter of moral principle. It was more on a matter of political expediency that Lincoln did that, held up. So Salmon Chase would still be supporting Lincoln for the 1864 election, and then Salmon gets to be Chief Justice in 1865. So that's kind of how that happened. Now, what happens here historically is Andrew Johnson, who before the last president was considered to be the worst president ever in American history, um, he had a terrible relationship with Congress, terrible relationship with the authors of the 14th Amendment. He was a very violent racist. Um, you know, just couldn't quite get the idea that black people could have full civil rights, just didn't, didn't phase, just didn't get there. He didn't believe in slavery. He fought against slavery. He thought it was terrible, but couldn't go beyond that. Well, see, in 1866, John, Johnson nominates Henry Stanbury for the Supreme Court. And what the Congress did is it just eliminated the seat. <laughs> so we go from 10 justices, and Congress then lowers the number down to seven so that Andrew Johnson didn't get any appointments at all. Now, you can't fire a justice. Once they're in, they're in. 
But what you can do is eliminate their seat. So when they die or resign, Congress and the president can't fill it. Because Congress sets a number of justices, but the Constitution protects the justice once that justice is in the seat. Okay. So that's what they did to kind of kind of just stick it to you know Andrew Johnson. Uh, what happens is Grant becomes president in 1869, and Congress immediately sets the number back to nine. First day in office, Grant gets two Supreme Court justices immediately of the four he ultimately appoints during his presidency. So kind of a nice little windfall for you know, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. William Strong and Joseph Bradley, who, by the way, Bradley is going to come up later on. So look, there was reason to believe this court could have been better. And you know, the Ulysses S. Grant was, was actually a great president for civil rights. And as we talked about last time, really wiped out the first iteration of the Klan. So here we go with weight and race in the Supreme Court. The first case that comes in is the slaughterhouse cases. 1873, 14th Amendment's first chance that the court gets its hands on the 14th Amendment. Pivotal case in early civil rights law. And it has to do with privileges and immunities clause. Um, and they said it only protects the legal rights of federal citizenship, not state citizenship. Well, you know, first of all, what the heck does that mean? Here's what happened. New Orleans got tired of animal guts floating down the Mississippi River. Uh, what happened, there were these slaughterhouses upstream and they were contaminating the water, causing cholera. About a mile and a half upstream from New Orleans were thousand, thousand butchers that gutted more than 300,000 animals per year. And what they did with all the guts was they just threw them in the river and floats down to New Orleans, all right? It's called Ulfit, by the way. Uh, I'm given to understand that haggis, the Scottish dish, is actually kind of made from Ulfit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Louisiana passed a law allowing New Orleans to create a corporation to move the slaughterhouses. Uh, they were using what the slaughterhouses did, by the way, is, you know, these are big profit making little corporations going on here. They didn't want to directly challenge it. They got the butcher's union to bring the case because, you know, we're, we're pro worker here, even though it has to do with the profit of the corporation, uh, to challenge the constitutionality of these little effort to move these, these slaughterhouses. Um, and so, what they said, it violated the right to sustain their lives through labor. It looks like kind of fits on the 14th Amendment, right? Well, this is one of these things a case facially having nothing to do with civil rights, but had everything to do in reality. Because everybody knows what's underlying this thing. In a, four to, a five to four decision, Justice Miller writes, the 14th Amendment does not restrict a state's police powers. The 14th Amendment's first sentence, all persons are citizens of the United States and the state where they reside, actually creates two types of citizenship. The second sentence forbidding states from making any law which should have written only applied to the federal citizenship rights. Did you all get that? Okay, I'm sure I, I don't think I quite get it yet. Okay, that's just pure sophistry. I mean, if you read the 14th Amendment, they clearly intended this is a national baseline of rights should be. The state versus federal rights is absurd. Federal citizenship rights in 1870 was the right to travel between states and use navigable rivers. That's what it was defined. A couple of the little ones going on there too, but that's basically what it is. So, okay, you're a black person in the South being discriminated against with Jim Crow laws, but you can be happy that you can you know, have the right to use navigable rivers. Okay, that, that's essentially what's going on here. Now, this kind of comes up again, by the way, Justice Kavanaugh, and I'll just point this out, this concurrence in Dobbs, you know, the decision overturning Rosa versus Wade rights. As I see it, some of the other abortion-related legal questions raised by today's decision are not especially difficult as a constitutional matter. For example, may a state bar a resident of that state from traveling to another state to obtain an abortion? In my view, the answer is, is no, based on the constitutional right to interstate travel. No. So, so what he's Kavanaugh is saying, he's actually going back to the slaughterhouse cases and saying, yeah, there's a federal right to interstate travel and no state could actually prevent a person from going to another state for whatever reason that person does. So, but the stuff kind of raises its head in kind of unanticipated ways, because of course he votes to overturn Roe versus Wade, but puts this little thing in as a nod back to the law before, okay, and the slaughterhouse cases. So according to Miller and the court, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1 of the Constitution, the citizens of each state 
she'll be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, was not the same in scope as 14th Amendment, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall bridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. So they're not equal. The 14th Amendment Privileges and Immunities Clause speaks only of the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States and does not speak to those of citizens of the several states. Thus, the entire domain of the privileges and immunities of the states lay within the constitutional legislative power of the states and not the federal government. Okay. What about this little language, no state shall make or enforce any law which the group of privileges and immunities of the citizens of the United States? I just don't see how you get there as a matter of clear, simple reading the statute. You don't have to go to law school to figure this one out. No state. The slaughterhouse majority ignored what Representative Bingham wrote and the people ratified a broad protection of constitutional rights for citizens of the United States under a national constitution. The 14th Amendment Privileges Clause referred to the same privileges and immunities in Article 4 of the Constitution. They were meant to be a broad protection of rights. The 14th Amendment original intent was no state can favor one person or group under the law over another. Now, the scope guarantees every citizen gets all the rights the U.S. Constitution provides. Scope, according to Slaughterhouse, so the 14th Amendment guarantees every U.S. citizen gets all the rights the U.S. Constitution provides, right? The intended scope is all states' privileges and immunities apply to all Americans under the 14th Amendment. They're intended to be a bridge to put these things together. Now, the authors, the actual authors of the 14th Amendment, denounce the slaughterhouse cases in no uncertain terms. Different levels of citizenship is inconsistent with being an American, an American, right? And what, what, excuse me, different levels of citizenship is inconsistent with an American conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, Justice Noah Swayze um, was the four justices who dissented. Now, he got this right. Liberty is freedom from all restraints. Beyond that line lies the domain of usurpation and tyranny. The equal protection of the laws places upon all upon a footing of equal equality and gives the same protection to all for the preservation of life, liberty, and property, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Justice Noah here is kind of sounding a little bit like Abraham Lincoln, which is good. That's what it was supposed to be. The 14th Amendment novelty was known and measured deliberately adopted. In other words, that's the original intent. To enable the nation to secure to everyone within its jurisdiction the rights and privileges enumerated, which all are entitled to enjoy. Without such authority, any government claiming to be national is glaringly defective. So, what Slaughterhouse did was just gutted the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. So rather than a new birth of freedom, the court paved the road for states to overrule the national foundation of rights. 1833, Barron versus Baltimore, the court held the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. Slaughterhouse held the same. What would have been a point of the 14th Amendment? What would have been a point of the Civil War? Then we get the United States versus Cruikshank. Now, the United States versus Cruikshank gets talked a lot about gun rights people, the Second Amendment people. Um, this got, part of this got overturned in the Heller decision. Uh, so you'll have Second Amendment people really rail against how terrible Cruikshank is without even understanding really how terrible Cruikshank is. Uh, they held that the First Amendment does not, doesn't apply to the states. And the Second Amendment doesn't apply to the states either. Now, this idea that the First Amendment doesn't apply to the states we find utterly absurd today. Uh, but in reality, it wasn't until 1925 in Gitmore versus York, <clears throat> the court actually did hold that it applied under the vehicle of the 14th Amendment. And of course, the Second Amendment is a big one from the National Rifle Association. So, you know, we can take common cause on this one with the National Rifle Association. DC versus Heller and McDonald versus Chicago basically held that individual right to bear arms applies to states. And frankly, I, I think those were correct decisions. 
I did not think so at the time, but then after reading Cruikshank and what happened to it, I came to that conclusion. Uh, by the way, just a rule of thumb, and I think you may have heard me say this other times. You want a definition of what a right is in America. Anything black people were denied, that's it. <laughs> okay, you want a short rule of thumb, that's the best way to define what an American right is. And, and black people were always denied their second. So what happens? 1872, Louisiana gubernatorial election was hotly disputed with Reconstruction Republicans and racist Democrats claiming the victory. A federal judge ruled the Republicans uh, uh, ruled for the Republicans, but the Democrats didn't accept this. And it was clear that the Republicans won. White Democrats armed with rifles and a small cannon overpowered Republican freedmen and a black state militia protecting the courthouse and coal bats. Most of the freedmen were killed after they had surrendered. Estimates of dead ranged from 62 to 153, thrown into the river or unmarked graves. Now, there were three racists that were killed. And if you have any doubt what their intention was, here is their grave marker. Three whites also killed, erected to the memories of the heroes who fell in the Colfax riot fighting for white supremacy. <laughs> There's no doubt about this. They were proud of this. There's no you know, subtlety here in the least. That's what this was about. Now, you want a history versus myth. This is a mark of Colfax riot, not the massacre, it's riot. And what it reads is on this site occurred the Colfax riot, which in, in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. This event on April 13th, 1870, marked the end of the carpetbag misrule in the South. Notice the use there of passive voice when it says, okay, when were slain. No, they, the white people murdered them. But we use passive voice. We refer to it as a, a riot, not a massacre, which it clearly was. And they create this mythology of carpetbag misrule in the South. Utterly popular. Several of the white insurgents convicted under it. 1870 Enforcement Act for hindering the Freedmen's First Amendment right and to assemble and the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Cases were taken up in federal court. Convictions appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Chief Justice White gets it. A wait. And the 14th Amendment due process and equal protection clauses apply only to state action, not individual action. The Second Amendment only restricts the national government. This is the rulings in the case. This is not a right granted by the Constitution, neither is it in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence, according to Justice Brooks. Thus, states can restrict the right, be it the right to assembly or the right to bear arms. The court again relied on Barron versus Baltimore, 1833, that the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. Thus, the massacre of a political gathering in Colfax implicated neither the first nor the second amendments because it was for state, not federal election. It was a state election. Therefore, it just didn't apply. The first amendment was not intended to limit the powers of, of the state governments in respect to their own citizens, but to operate upon the national government alone. Thus, for the protection in its enjoyment, the people must look to the states. The power for that purpose was originally placed there and has never been surrendered to the United States. Okay, I'm sorry, never surrendered. What about the surrendered Appomattox? Yeah, yeah. What about the civil rights legislation, the Freedmen's Bill, Reconstruction, all passed over Andrew Johnson's presidential vetoes, showing a huge majority in favor of these new birth of freedom. Congress will have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. 14th Amendment intent. I prepared the first section of the 14th Amendment as it stands in the Constitution to meet Marshall's objection that the existing amendments are not applied to and do not bind the states. John Bingham was directly answering John Marshall's 1833 decision. It was intended to change it. Benjamin Butler, Massachusetts, if the federal government cannot pass laws to protect the rights, liberty, and lives of the citizens of the United States in the states, why were guarantees of those fundamental rights put in the Constitution at all? Perfectly valid question. 
The 14th Amendment, no state shall, meant for the Bill of Rights to apply to the states. For the Reconstruction Republicans, the Bill of Rights defined the 14th Amendment's privileges and immunities clauses. Senator Jacob Howard introduced the 14th Amendment, said the first eight amendments did not operate in the slightest degree as a restraint or provision on state legislation. States are not affected by them. But the 14th Amendment meant to change this. The great object of the first section of this amendment is therefore to restrain the power of states to compel them at all times to respect the great fundamental guarantees. They answered the argument before the court even got the case. <clears throat> Anybody with any inkling to be an originalist should be very clear. This is a clear path. This is far clearer than most of the things people say James Madison considered on some length. This couldn't be any clearer in the legislative history. There was no new birth of freedom that day at the court hand the Appalachian. The court cleared the way for the violent restoration of white supremacy and segregation unchecked for a century. Brings us to the civil rights cases, 1883. It held the 1875 Civil Rights Act unconstitutional. If you recall last week, I talked about the passing of the 1875. Um, Civil Rights Act. The court went out of its way to do this, by the way. It wasn't even particularly a dispute. The court worked to get to it. It would, would to be, well, at the time, and today would be called that name, dicta, but it became the rule. The 1875 Civil Rights Act banned race discrimination and access to public services. But the court held Congress lacked authority to regulate private affairs in the 14th Amendment, and the 13th Amendment merely abolishes slavery. What about Section 5 again? Sorry to keep harping on poor Section 5, but it kind of keeps making my point. Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Justice Harlan famously dissented. Anybody want to like, you know, light a couple of loaded candles to Justice Harlan? That's perfectly fine by me. Justice Bradley, who wrote the opinion, it would be running the slavery argument into the ground to make every act of discrimination which a person may see fit to make as to the guests he will entertain or as to the people we take into his coach or cab or car to admit to his concert or theater or deal with in other matters of intercourse or business. Can't have that. Bradley earlier in the memo uh, to Justice William Woods kind of belying his myopic view of race. It never can be endured that the white shall be compelled to lodge and eat and sit with the Negro. The antipathy of race cannot be crushed and annihilated by legal enactment. This freedom of the blacks requires slavery of the whites. Enforced fellowship would be that. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty stark. I mean, this guy ever see what slavery was really about? Now look, the bottom, the first point of this, enforced fellowship is not even the issue here. <clears throat> You are perfectly free in your private interactions to discriminate against anybody you want to in America. It is your constitutional right. You're going to be a jerk, but you're perfectly free to be a jerk. That's just America, right? The issue is, what is the right to public accommodations, public access, public transportation? Nobody disagreed with Bradley that choosing the guests one entertains was a social, not a civil right. Nobody disagreed. Okay, no guess who's coming to dinner. Okay, fine, Justice Bradley, you don't have to have Sidney Portier at your house, even though if he is going to marry your daughter, all right? Loving versus Virginia, all right? 85 years later, would have caused Bradley's head to spin. The Bradley and the court missed the fundamental point. For a new birth of freedom, society must not deny anybody access to basic goods in the public Accommodations. This includes access to a cab or concert or theater or deal with other matters of intercourse or business. To make it in simple terms, this is more than just denying a black person access to a lunch counter or a hotel room. It's the essential rights of free labor and equality in competition for advancement in an economic marketplace. Simple example how are you going to make it to the job interview if you can't catch a cab? because the cab won't pick you up. That's just not fair. <clears throat> and to spin this out a little more, the cab is driving on public streets, paid for by public taxes, 
pay for it by black people, white people, everybody else. So you can't say, well, it's my private cab and my private company, I can discriminate against who I want. Well, okay, then you just drive on your private driveway and you can go ahead and discriminate. But the moment you get off your private driveway and drive down the public street, which the potholes are filled by the taxes of everybody, you got to take everybody on because you're offering a public service. Now, of course, I draw the connection. I've done it before. The same thing with cake papers. Well, it comes right down to it. The civil rights cases, of course, created the state versus private discrimination distinction. Okay? Anything privately owned, nor for 14th Amendment right. But even privately owned accommodations are still public. All businesses benefit from streets, police, fire protection, other government services. Everyone has to support, including taxes of black people, gay people, Chinese people, every kind of people we want to imagine. Having your cake and eating it too. Cakes. Now, there is an argument that you know they have a right to their artistic expression. I actually think that second cake is pretty artistic, maybe qualified. The first cake I could do. My definition of art is anything I can do ain't art. <laughs> I might be good with PowerPoints, but that's because I really can't draw a straight line. I mean, it's a simple matter as that. But okay, so you could say you got some artistic expression, okay? But it's really not about cakes. We all know it's not about cakes. Overfield versus Hodges, so the 14th Amendment due process and equal protection clauses guarantee the fundamental right to marry. Which I suppose if you're offering wedding cakes, then you've got to offer it to everybody as a public, if you're a public business, right? Now, if somebody comes in, it's kind of a subtle here. Somebody comes in and says, I want a rainbow cake. And you could say, I don't do rainbow cakes. It's not what I offer. Just don't offer. That means you've got to have a devil's food cake or something like that, right? But then if a four-year-old wants in and comes in and says, for my birthday party, I want a rainbow cake. And then you make that four-year-old a rainbow cake. Now you're clearly discriminating. Because you can't offer service one. You can you can not offer a specific service. You just say we don't make rainbow cakes in this establishment. But then you can't then offer it to somebody else. Okay. Justice Marshall, the sense. Now he's an interesting guy. He's a man from a slaveholding family, called out the court's hypocrisy, ignoring the Civil War amendments in the tent. Uh, he fought in the Civil War for the Union. Uh, he was ridiculed at the time, but he became the clarion for the civil rights of the next century. Harlan agreed, the government has nothing to do with social rights of individuals. And if one citizen chooses not to hold social intercourse with another, he is not and cannot be made amenable to the law for his conduct in that regard. Fair enough, fine. That's still true in America today. But the 13th Amendment did something more than prohibit slavery as an institution. It established and decreed universal civil freedom throughout the United States. The 1975 Civil Rights Act secured legal, not social rights. Justice Harlan is absolutely correct. The right of a black person to access public accommodations was no more a social right than the right to sit in public building with others of whatever race for the purpose of hearing and uh, the, the public questions of the day discussed. The majority sacrificed the substance and spirit of the recent amendments. <clears throat> He was absolutely correct. The men who wrote the 14th Amendment intended to rectify the mistake of Dred Scott and other pre Civil War cases supporting slavery. They intended to do for human liberty the fundamental rights of American citizenship what it did with the sanction of this court for the protection of slavery. It's very clear on this. What the court did to suck up to the slave power, the writers of the amendment purposely decided to do the opposite. Nearly 100 years passed before a Supreme Court less smothered by racism came to this obvious conclusion. Now, Bradley did recognize the right to enjoy equal accommodation and privileges in all ends, public conveyance, and places of public amusement is one of the essential rights of citizenship. But the 1875 Civil Rights Act exceeded what the 14th Amendment allowed. Stunning in its like, logical jump where he gets there. He then went on to find the act unconstitutional, and that was the last piece of civil rights legislation until about 1957, and of course the bigger ones in 1965 and 66. I also raised a real question of what the appropriate 
level of judicial reviews. Now, this is kind of legally technicality stuff. You know, what level of review does the court give a given question? Marger versus Madison established judicial law. The courts can invalidate legislation and executive orders. They don't pass muster of the Constitution. That's where you get the term holding something unconstitutional. Judicial review is not explicit in the Constitution, but it is clearly intended. And it's kind of the oil that makes the whole system work. Now, Congress passes statutes under various parts of the Constitution all the time. Much of the new bill was passed, for instance, under the Commerce Clause. The Supreme Court regularly reviews these for constitutionality. But under other like Unlike other parts of the Constitution, each Reconstruction Amendment ends the same way. What is it? <laughs> Congress will have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Congress passed this. The people of the United States ratified this as their new way, their new Constitution. Um, and I think my point is this. After Taney's failure on slavery, Congress, not and the nation that elected and the nation that ratified these amendments, Congress intended that they would be the definers of these rights, not the courts. Congress would be the first guardians, not the courts. The Supreme Court should have been far more deferential to any act of Congress under the 14th Amendment, and for that matter, under the 13th and 15th as well. What I am saying is not part of constitutional law. There is no legal foundation for this currently, but if you look at the history, there should be a much higher deference to the acts of Congress on issues of racial justice than there is on any other statute the court reviews because of the way these things are written. Congress will have the power. In a sense, the amendments curtail judicial review to some extent that doesn't exist for other statutes and parts of and that was intended. When I get to the US Supreme Court, I'll be sure to try to work that in somehow. <laughs> <laughs> now, the justice and the majority fully wanted to end slavery. They were anti slavery. There's no question about that. Uh, several fought to end it during the Civil War, but they could not comprehend, much less accept, the idea of a black person as a social group. That is what gummed up their reason. If you work from that premise, you can kind of see where they get there with the reason. But other than that, it's unfathomable to me. The civil rights cases laid the legal foundation for American apartheid, which Plessy versus Ferguson expanded in the next decade. Now, after gutting the privileges and immunities clause and the due process clauses, what about using the equal protection clause? Remember, you got that extra clause there in the, in the court. Um, so the kind of the People pushing for civil rights and the right understanding of these amendments said, okay, let's go with the Equal Protection Clause. Let's see what we do with that. Plessy versus Ferguson was the case, upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities under a separate but equal fiction. Again, Justice Harlan famously dissented. The 14th Amendment purpose was a broad protection against racial discrimination and public accommodations. Slaughterhouse civil rights eliminated the 14th Amendment privileges and immunities. Proponents of racial justice tried another source of protection, the Equal Protection Clause. But here's the question. Think about this. What is the easiest way to defeat an Equal Protection Clause argument? Utterly separate. Say it's separate but equal. It has a certain elegance to it even though it's utterly disingenuous. Separate but equal takes away everything based on a total fiction, but it nails that coffin pretty well. 1833, excuse me, 1883, the civil rights cases held Congress could do nothing against private discrimination. 13 years later, Plessy versus Ferguson took the civil rights cases a step further. It approved government mandated racial sex in public facilities, even when the private owners did not wish to do so. This takes us to a level of absurdity, even beyond what they had done before. Now, what happens? East Louisiana Railroad Company, they were the good guys in this. They didn't want to maintain segregated rail systems. 
Now, they probably had some real freedom of justice, et cetera, but what's the other reason? They didn't want to maintain two whole car systems. Money. So they actually financed this whole case. It was a kind of a test case. Um, it, it was orchestrated to test the Louisiana's 1897 Car Act. In June 7, 1892, Homer Plessy bought a first-class rail ticket from the East Louisiana Railroad for the whites only car. Now, Plessy was passé long. He could have passed. He was what's called an octoroon, which meant he had one grandparent who was black. Uh, he, I mean, he looked like a white guy. But they chose it for particularly that reason, okay, to show the absurdity of these racial classifications, okay? So he's, um, so he has a one eighth black ancestry. And so what happens? Um, but even one drop black blood meant that he had to sit in the quote colored car. The railroad arranged for a private investigator to peacefully arrest him on a specific charge of violating the Seventh Car Act. So he didn't get arrested on, for instance, trespassing or all kinds of other things. They arrested him just on that and they arranged for his private arrest so you wouldn't get some dumb police officer arrested him on too much. They wanted to focus. This is all orchestrated in this case. Now, the court upheld the Separate Car Act because the 13th Amendment just eliminated slavery, the 14th Amendment civil rights did not include a social right to sit next to white people. The 14th Amendment did not abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or to or a commingling of the two races in part of the terms unsatisfactory to either. Well, first of all, that's not even what this question is about. Nobody is advocating forced amalgamation. Nobody's really advocating that here. Now, most of us in the room believe, you know, amalgamation is actually a pretty damn good thing, but that's not even what's being talked about at this point. In the court's fictional world, everything was separate but equal. The, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause could not apply. Black people could expect nothing more from the Constitution. And no problem for Black people to declare it Justice Brown because it was a fallacy for Black people to assume the enforced separation of the two racial stamps, the colored race with a badge of majority. If this be so, it is because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. I find that to be appallingly condescending. So not only did Black people suffer second class citizenship and inferior services, even though they paid the same fares, taxes, and bills, any problem with it was in their own mind. Now, the question is often asked by scholars: is Justice Billings Brown, Henry Billings Brown, is he naive or disingenuous? I'm definitely the disingenuous category. White people believed black people were inferior and wanted to be separate because they thought they were not equal. That's why they created it to pass the law. So to come in and say, oh, it's just what black people put upon it is just absurd. So what do we got here? Brown and the court created the perfect formula to defeat any equal protection claim. Separate but equal is as glib as it is dishonest. The court, in fact, ignored, frankly, the privacy rights of the owners. Just as Bradley had put, remember in the civil rights case, as to the people, okay, the law should not dictate as the people he will take into his coach or cab or car. Well, that should mean under Justice Bradley that if I want black people in my coach, cab, or car, I should be allowed to put them in. I can't be forced by government to do it, according to him. Well, now what's happening is the government is saying you can't do that as a private matter. You're not allowed to put in your train who you want. The East Louisiana, Louisiana Railroad Company opposed the separate car act and supported Plessy's cause. If the court would have been consistent with Bradley's opinion 13 years earlier, it would have found the separate car act unconstitutional for preventing a private company from serving black people if it chose to do so. This is the level that this thing just spun all out of the original intent of the 14th Amendment. John Marshall Hahn was again the lone prophetic dissenter. Louisiana's separate car should not actually not stand because the arbitrary separation of citizens on race is wholly inconsistent with the civil freedom and equality before the law established by the Constitution. It cannot be justified upon any legal grounds. 
And frankly, I think uh, what Justice Harlan is doing here is even talking about the basic constitutional structure itself, not just the 14th Amendment. But if you go back to the concept of we the people and look at the preamble to the Constitution, the general welfare clauses, you can justify what he said under that, even leaving aside the 14th Amendment. The white race deems itself to be dominant race in this country, and so it is in prestige and achievements and education and wealth and power. So I no doubt it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. Now, it's careful. When Harlan writes of the white race's dominance, he is not asserting black people are genetically inferior in any way. Rather, the social constructs of prestige, achievements, education, wealth, and power provide this advantage. Only holding fast to university constitutional liberty can America claim its heritage, and Louisiana betray that heritage. That, I think, is the point that Harlan is making. But in the view, here's the next one. In the view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. By the way, the only part people full screen, <coughs> this, is, this is all people, when you go back to Plessy, Harlan's the only one anybody quotes. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or his color when his civil rights is as guaranteed by the supreme law of the land and the law. Those two little paragraphs or little lines are what really remains of Plessy today. Abraham Lincoln in 1858 actually voiced something very similar. He would have lamented Plessy as he argues. United as one people through this land, urged Americans. During the war, Lincoln ordered South Carolina tax commissioners to apply taxes equally to the education of colored youths of such poor white persons as in your judgment shall be most eligible. Clearly, Plessy was not part of Abraham Lincoln's vision of the Negroes of the Middle East. And separate is not and has never been equal. That's just very clear all around the history. Now, in 1789, when James Madison introduced the Bill of Rights to Congress, he defined the role of the federal courts as independent tribunals of justice that would consider themselves in peculiar manner the guardians of those rights. The court was to be an impenetrable bulwark against every assumption of power in the legislative or executive that would violate an individual's rights because they will be naturally led to resist every encroachment upon rights expressly stipulated for in the Constitution by the Declaration of Rights, the Bill of Rights. Well, the Supreme Court should have been that impenetrable bulwark protecting individual rights rather than the opposite. So, in my judgment, I haven't read that first part, but in my judgment, the, uh, in my opinion, the judgment this day rendered, uh, rendered will in time prove to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this tribunal in Dred Scott. I think it's widely viewed by that way was among scholars, but the court still has no rule. Now, there is an argument that Dred Scott, leaving aside Roger Taney's ugly, gratuitous dicta about black people, was correctly decided around the Constitution of 1857. I don't particularly agree with that, but there is an argument to that effect. How could the court continue to read the Constitution the same after the Civil War and amendments? Slaughterhouse, Cruikshank, Civil Rights, Plessy versus Ferguson. The court eliminated Congress's authority to protect civil rights under the 14th Amendment. And the problem started with the judges, by the way. 27 Confederate veterans became federal judges after the Civil War. Four became Supreme Court justices. These men decided cases including the Klan and Jim Crow issues. Confederate veteran Edward White was in the majority in Plessy versus Ferguson. What happened is that they went on as if they had never been traitors to the United States, which they had. After Reconstruction, giving the South judgeships proved a kind of a special type of reconciliation. It gave the South power in the most non-democratic branch of government to protect the race's power structure. 
mid 20th century civil rights uh, movement, Georgia Lieutenant Governor and staunch segregationist uh, Ernest Vandiver expressed satisfaction that our judges are steeped in the same traditions. I am, thank God, we've got good federal judges. That's what they are. Now, in reality, Van Deaver wasn't quite that bad in kind of behind the scenes. He worked with the Kennedys and did a lot of other things, but this was his public statement about judges at the time. While being a traitor did not stop a lawyer from becoming a Supreme Court justice, being a black man did. Among the first black men to serve in the 41st and 42nd Congresses were two lawyers, Josiah Walls and Robert Elliott. Remember the man who eloquently argued for the 1875 Civil Rights Act. Okay. No capable black man ever received the Supreme Court nomination. <coughs> now, I'm not sure it probably would have caused quite enough people if they would have nominated somebody, but you know, it just goes to show you that being a traitor to the country didn't disqualify you, but being a black person did. So, how do we start confronting this flawed legal legacy? Well, we talk about how you count people. One drop rule, passing whites. Walter Francis White was actually a black man who was head of the NAACP from 1931 to 1935, <clears throat> helped lay the foundation and the legal strategy to dismantle desegregation one piece at a time, one thread at a time. He oversaw plans and organized an organizational structure of the fight against public segregation. He authored President Truman's uh, desegregation to the troops in 1947, for instance. Charles Hamilton Houston was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate at Amherst College and the first African American to read Harvard Law Review. He then got an advanced degree from Harvard, studied abroad, and returned to his father's thriving Washington, D.C. legal practice. He left a lucrative law practice to become a law professor and dean of the Harvard Law School and head of the defense law. He hooks up with Thurgood Marshall uh, to lead the Legal Defense Fund, teams of black and white lawyers for racial justice. Incrementalism was the key. And frankly, their strategy is what every social engineering movie still uses today, whether they're the Christian Coalition or Planned Parenthood or everybody else. It's all about incrementalism and taking things apart from the foundation up. Alliance defending freedom, any group, they all are playing in the same playbook that was developed by the legal defense fund. So how do we count men, white, brown, and black? Seven years before Brown, the Ninth Circuit dealt with Westminster versus Mendez, 1947. What it did was, well, okay, yeah, segregation between black and white people. What do you do with brown people? I mean, it kind of creates a hell of a problem. I mean, do they get to be on the white side? They can be on the black side. And if you're going to get all racial on this stuff, brown people kind of mess you up because it's literally, that's it. It's not black and white. <laughs> <laughs> so this case comes through, and the Ninth Circuit was just great. Thurgood Marshall's involved in the case, Robert Carter. Uh, Lauren Miller from the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, Amicus Curi. They are fighting this whole case. We get a postage stamp today, Mendez versus Westminster. Step by step, for 20 years, the LDF disassembled the segregationist foundation to erode Plessy versus Ferguson. And the Ninth Circuit in Mendez versus Westminster said, held unconstitutional the forced segregation of Mexican American students. The paramount re uh, requisite. An American system of public education is social equality. It must be open to all children by unified school association, regardless of lineage. This is seven years before Brown comes down, but this is the work they're doing. George W. McLaurin held a master's degree from the University of Kansas and was a retired professor. He decides to go to law school. The University of Oklahoma accepted him because they didn't have a picture in the application, so they accepted George McLaurin. And lo and behold, God forbid, he turned out to be black. So what happens? Um, the LDF won the case in federal court, so he has to be matriculated at the University of Oklahoma. So although the university had to admit him, they segregated him from the other students, and he attended a class in an alcove they had reserved for color. Now, what they really start doing is just utterly absurd. They actually, through a series of cases, whether it's painful, the forms, the red regions, et cetera, 
<laughs> they actually start to create an entire separate law school for one guy. I mean, it's just absurdly expensive. The court ruled his treatment must be equal with white students, imposing a huge expense of maintaining separate and equal facade. Now, Fred M. Vinson wrote for the court, McLaurin is handicapped in the pursuit of effective graduate instruction. Such restrictions impair and inhibit his ability to study, to engage in discussion and exchange views with other students, and in general, to learn his profession. Great decision from 1950 from Justice Vinson. The disparity of resources are now quantifiable. They don't have to just say, oh, separate with equal looks bad. They can actually start to count up budgets and you can go in with objective facts. Now they won the second against the separate with equal of graduate education. So that was kind of the first step after the Mendes decision. Now, here's what's interesting. Just as Vinson led a divided court when Brown versus Board of Education comes up in 1953. Now, despite his good opinion in McLaurin, four years earlier, he would have affirmed separate but equal and Plessy versus Ferguson. So fortunately for us, but unfortunately for him, he died in September 8, 1953. Now there was this deal that Earl Warren made with Dwight Eisenhower, because Earl Warren was a contender for the Republican nomination, that he would get the next Supreme Court in place. Well, Earl Warren or Dwight Eisenhower wasn't counting it would be the chief justiceship, but that's the first <laughs> one that came open. So October 5th, right? Anniversary was yesterday. 1953, a new chief justice comes in court, Earl Warren. And this is a man who believed in a court with the new birth of free. Here's the other picture of the Warren court. Now, what he did for a first term, first October term chief justice was just remarkable. I mean, an experienced Chief Justice would have had trouble pulling this off. He implores, he persuades, he cajoled the other justices. He even visited one convalescing in a hospital to get them to have a majority opinion in the overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. First year as Chief Justice, first term. By the way, you know, the terms begin in October. He starts October 5th. The term began when he, when he starts, right? Unanimously overturning plus an achievement for any chief, but one in his first year, just remarkable. May 17, 1955, he reads Brown to a packed courtroom. Come then to the question presented, said the chief. Does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, derive, deprive the children of the majority group of equal educational opportunities? He paused. We believe that it does. Right at that point, America changed for the better. In that very moment. The plaintiffs are, by segregation, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Looks like somebody finally on the court read the 14th Amendment. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has been place, separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. <clears throat> Brown was a sea change from an all-white court. Remember, Thurgood Marshall doesn't end up on the court. He's arguing this case. He's not sitting for justice. It laid, it, it was a sea change from an all-white court, but its foundation was the brilliant legal work and strategy of the LDF, dismantling separate but equal by showing separate but never now, their work followed the brilliant work of countless other lawyers, black and white, thousands of freedom suits for slaves. Dred Scott and Plessy lost in their day, but they did not give up. The reaction to this was terrible. <coughs> Brown did not solve everything. 19 senators and 77 Congress signed the Southern Manifesto, defending segregation and condemning Brown's clear abuse of power. White Citizens Council claimed the Constitution that the 10th Amendment protected states' rights and white rule. Segregationists argued the 14th Amendment had not been ratified. <laughs> Georgia adopted a resolution urging Congress to declare void the 14th and 15th Amendments. Just for your information, Congress cannot declare an amendment <laughs> void. Just can't do it. Calls for Warren's impeachment became perennial. 
mixing race is communism. But America would not go back. Earl Warren became the, chief's fourth, the court's 14th chief justice. When he became chief justice, Jim Crow ruled the South. States disenfranchised blacks with impunity. The Bill of Rights did not generally apply against the states. The court never used the First Amendment to invalidate a congressional action. Some states chilled core political expression. State organized prayers were common in public schools. State criminal defendants had few constitutional rights. No general right to vote existed. Almost all state legislatures were now apportioned. Over the next 16 years, all this changed, cementing the Warren Court's enduring influence in creating a new birth of freedom. You can look what the current court is doing to try to dismantle this, and they're working hard to do so. But the fact remains, this is still Earl Warren's country, and they're just living in it. And they're not going to be there forever. People ask, what can you do about people like Clarence Thomas? My thought is, make sure to send in that subscription to Omaha Steaks. Just, just keep them going. <laughs> <laughs> Loving versus Virginia ended all bans on racial interracial marriage. In criminal procedure, Gideon versus Wainwright required all defendants to get lawyers. Miranda versus Arizona were kind of required famous Miranda warnings. All were revolutionary in creating a more just America. But the Warren Court left much to do. Aside from Brown directly overturning Plessy, the court has not overturned Slaughterhouse, Cruikshank, and the civil rights cases. Jones versus Albert Meyer, in fact, specifically avoided overturning the civil rights cases, instead insisted that the 1964 Civil Rights Act rather than largely academic. Well, I'm sorry, I want a little more than that. They need to be overturned. <clears throat> the court continues to the, the state action, private action dichotomy, sometimes called de facto versus de jure discrimination, that slaughterhouse Cruikshank and the civil rights uh, cases case created. In a judicial system based on precedent, these past reconstruction decisions live on no matter how racist or faulty their historical foundation was. Generally, the United States Supreme Court is not championed Lincoln's new birth of freedom, but instead is the primary defender, defender of white privilege and racial inequality. That's been really the historical reality. So this, of course, leads us to what we're going to talk about next week. Even after the 14th Amendment, the full right of every American to vote was not a reality. The post-Civil War amendments led to the Reconstruction Republicans knew that they needed to have a 15th Amendment to fix the original framers' failure. All men are created equal, which we still know the Constitution needs yet today. So that's where I'm going to leave this tonight. Oh, okay. Again, the 14th Amendment is the constitutional expression of De Jefferson's Declaration, all men are created equal. And Lincoln's address, this country shall, it was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Okay. So that's where I'll leave this tonight. Are there any questions? How hard was it for Warren to get a unanimous decision? I don't know, but he pulled it off. <laughs> I don't know what he did. Yeah. There's, there's, there's books written on this about how he was able to pull this. I just think it's remarkable. So, yeah. Yeah, I remember reading the slaughterhouse cases in law school, and it was taken pretty seriously. We spent time on it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it scares me that maybe the court could invoke it again, uh, like with this North Carolina gerrymandering yeah. case. Um, I don't understand why. Why didn't the Warren Court uh, do six set? Good question. I'll, I'll tell you what's kind of interesting. Oddly enough, the only justice on the modern court that's called for the direct appeal has been Clarence Thomas. Repeal of slaughter the, the slaughterhouse, slaughterhouse case. Case. All this. And what he says is what the Warren Court, the answer to that is the Warren Court created a different mechanism. They created, they researched, they, they resurrected an old doctrine, the law of the Substance due process. And so they, by, by using due process issues, the process, they created kind of a concept of constitutional rights and this incorporation doctrine, which is kind of a tortured way to get where you need to go if you don't want to directly deal with precedent. It would have been much better to just deal with precedent and get rid of it. So, so that's why we spent so much time on that. 
because you had this slaughterhouse to see the tortured way to get it out. I think that's what the first is being And they did. They did. <laughs> Other questions? I have one comment and one okay. question. Okay. And my comment is we, at the very beginning, you're talking about the 14th. Uh, a woman also brought a claim to vote under the 14th, saying yeah. that the privileges and immunities gave her the right to vote. I don't remember the name of the case right now. But they just said, no, privilege and immunities does not give you any right to vote. So yeah. get out of here. So that was the end of that. And by the way, you guys, she did, she got by the whole month for 20 and I never got through. Got, okay. got through. Okay, my question is, I thought you said at the earlier on that Plessy has never been overturned, but just now you said that Brown overturned Plessy. Okay, I may have misspoke that. Um, I may have been talking about that. Well, what I was thinking was Slaughterhouse, the civil rights case, oh. had not been overturned. Plessy was. Plessy was. Plessy okay. was. Okay. Yeah, it explicitly was. Okay. Yeah, it was all kind of... Oh, it could have been me, misunderstanding too. No, but I'm actually just gratified bring this up instead of the grammatical error in this spelling, which is what you usually I'll, I'll email you about that later. <laughs> okay, very good. You know, it's interesting. I studied, my, my dissertation was on uh -huh. the votes uh, for cases um, during this period, and um, Brown was not a unanimous cert grant. It barely got in, and that's true of other civil rights cases, too. Right. Frankfurter voted against it, and there were other decisions I can't remember right now, but you know, they just didn't really want to, they didn't all want to go there. So no. Warren's achievement was really terrific. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll give you, a, you know, I've often mentioned the love of the The uh, the social science era was it took 15 years for the, for the country to approve what the court did in love of the Virginia. A lot of blacks and whites in there. 15 years. Now, when the overthrow decision came down, it was immediately set. In fact, the court was really behind public opinion. So it's hardly a courageous decision. But it just shows you just how you know courageous and, and well-reasoned Loving versus Virginia was and the other decisions in the book. You read uh, Miranda versus Arizona, it's one of the best originalist opinions that you ever see. Now, the original is one that wasn't a thing yet, but it was just steeped in what the history of the foundation was. But it's been chipped, 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 oh, chipped away, so horrible. it's not anything like it was. Nope. When it was first nope. adopted. That's a whole different lesson. And that's our a different John, lesson. Our John Craig was behind Miranda versus Arizona. Yes, he was. Well, yes, there's a lot of interesting stories behind that because John Flynn was there. So there's this whole problem of kind of the John Flynn performance and the John Frank performance. Oh. And they now everybody wants to claim it. Um, I have actually been on panels with. Uh, with uh, Captain Cody, who was the guy who arrested him, and he's still alive, yeah. and he's a pretty decent guy. But I had said in the thing, look, the police did nothing wrong in Miranda. That wasn't the point. He always liked Miranda. It was very touchy. Yeah. So, <laughs> we didn't do anything. They wrong. changed the law. They afterward. changed the law. Yeah. 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 You didn't do anything wrong. It's just the law changed. Yeah. Right. 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 You know? uh, but you know, there, there's this little under the surface debate in the legal community. Between the proponents of money. A lot of these folks are kind of passive now. You know, yeah. But uh, there's a certain uh, criminal defense attorney who's been since passed who knows his claim that he, you know, he had arrested Miranda. Well, Miranda had been arrested a lot of times by a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he wasn't actually arrested on that charge. But then other people would say, oh, no, he didn't have anything to do with it. So, so you get this little carpet going back and forth about that. It's a sophisticated kind of, John Frank was the great constitutional. Supreme Court lawyer, but the question there was, uh, was it a right under the Sixth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment? And it was actually John Flynn who established the Fifth Amendment as the key argument that ended up winning the court, even though Frank argued the Sixth Amendment, but also did not the Fifth. So, so all this stuff is churning around. Mm -hmm. so, and it's the child who makes good. When the kid graduates from college, all the parents claim. <laughs> <laughs> Any, Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, Bob, I have a question for you. Do you think the current Supreme Court is hostile towards the 14th Amendment, especially coming to that Dodge, you know, from the Wade yeah. and all these, you know, equal yeah. and law of privacy statement? Yeah, but, but it's it's really weird. Um, if you were to take 
the Second Amendment right now. This is a court that is not hostile to the Fourteenth Amendment mm -hmm. when it comes to Second Amendment issues. Right. So you, in terms of having a point of discussion with people, that's a hook that you can use to start to get a basic acceptance of the role. And a lot of people that talk about the Second Amendment rights of the individual privacy and the fair are, well, okay, so then I guess that means you also believe that's you know, the First Amendment. Or you think they'll use the 14th Amendment to outlaw affirmative action? Uh, they very well may. Yeah. Now, here's my point on that. If you look at this, is more the discussion last week. If you look at what the framers of the 14th Amendment, the Freedmen's Bureau, all those acts, Affirmative action is small potatoes. Fits right in there. Yeah, right. absolutely. It's, I mean, they sent federal troops down to enforce racial justice. Right. Affirmative action, now, you can have a policy argument that is affirmative action for this or that. I think it's absurd to say that it is unconstitutional. Right. Now, the argument you're going to get is, and they're going to take John Marshall Harlan's statement that we have colorblind constitution and turn it on its head. Oh, yeah. They've been doing that. They've been doing it. And it's, it's really, it's one of these superficially grim arguments that is other necessary. Even John Roberts did that. Right. He said, if you want a colorblind constitution, then stop talking about color. Right. Yeah. And, and that so was my two years yeah. later, answers in that. Right. That was just Chief Justice. Right. So they're going to play around. A contradiction? I don't think so. Because what Title IX says is if you offer offer opportunities for uh, scholarships and educational opportunities based on athletics, you have to offer the same amount to girls as you do the boys. Am I, am I catching you? Yeah, no, it, it just I, I think it wouldn't be needed because of the 14th, no, because of plus. Being overturned. But women well, are not in the Constitution, no, remember? We don't yeah. have rights. Yes. I mean, no, here's, no, here's, here's, here's the problem. Problem is college football. Oh, yeah. College basketball. football. Look, no, basketball, not so much because there's only five guys in the basketball team. There's 30 guys in the football field. They use up 30 scholarships. Uh, so you don't have a, a comparable women's sport that, that gives educational opportunity to athletics. For that number of women, right? Uh, so, so it's really, and a lot of the men's sports grumble that, oh yeah, you know, if, I, if you're a woman lacrosse player, you get a scholarship, and I'm a male lacrosse player, who's very talented, much better. If I don't, that's not fair. So the response to that is, well, go talk to the football program. Yeah, yeah, right. It's not the woman's fault; it's the football program's fault. They're taking them all. They're taking them all. So, and you know, sports. it's not equal anyway. Oh well, I know. Yeah. I, I'm free Title IX anyway. I think you're right. Right. So that's, yeah, so that's that. Any other questions, issues, discussion? Don't forget, we have the books here. Those of you who didn't get it last time, you need to get a birthday present, a Christmas present. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.